As many of you know, my name is Michael Dele Carpini. I'm dean of the school here. And on behalf of the Annenberg School for Communication, the Office of the President of the University of Pennsylvania, the Annenberg Public Policy Center, and the Institute for Public Service of the Annenberg School for Communication, I'd like to welcome you all, Annenberg faculty, students, staff, and our guests from the larger Penn community and beyond to the Annenberg Lecture. I'd like to do special welcomes to those who are here as attendees of the 20th anniversary celebration and symposium and working groups uh, uh, for the Annenberg Public Policy Center. There are so many distinguished people in this audience that probably too many to welcome individually for fear of time or missing someone, but I did want to acknowledge a few close friends and longtime supporters of the school who are in the audience. Judge Arlen Adams, former member of the United States Court of Appeals of the Third Circuit, and his wife, Nasa Adams. Judge Phyllis Beck, the first woman to serve as a judge on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. John LaTourette, member of the trustees of the Supporting Trust, and his wife, Audrey. And most specially, Dionne DeShong, daughter of Leonore Annenberg, and member of the trustees of the Annenberg School Supporting Trust. I want to thank you all and everyone else for being here tonight. The Annenberg Lecture is really a combination of two lectures here, both designed to honor the Ambassador and Mrs. Annenberg and all they've done for the school. Without their support and without their vision, this school would literally not exist. We've had a number of prestigious speakers at the school as part of these lectures. They've included people from the media, people from public affairs, people from government more specifically, people who are filmmakers. That prestigious list is being added to tonight by tonight's speaker. We're very proud and honored to have him with us, but the specific introductions of that speaker will be made by the former dean of the Annenberg School and current director of the Public Policy Center, Kathleen Hall Jamison. So please join me in welcoming Kathleen, who will introduce tonight's speaker. It's customary in some, in some circumstances on anniversaries to give people presents. This is the 20th anniversary of the founding of the Annenberg Public Policy Center. And I got my present when Floyd Abrams said that he would come and deliver the Annenberg Lecture today. I got my second present from Floyd Abrams this morning in the Wall Street Journal because he put in a little footnote of the op-ed, I think it's an op-ed, opinion piece that is praising part of this lecture that he was going to speak at the Annenberg Public Policy Center of the University of Pennsylvania today. And I added parenthetically, on the 20th anniversary of the Public Policy Center, because the Public Policy Center is such a wonderful place, thank you for that great anniversary present. <laughs> Floyd Abrams is a senior partner at a major law firm, but of course you know that, in New York City. He's the author of two books that we've used in our courses, Friend of the Court, On the Front Lines of the First Amendment, 2013, and Speaking Freely, Trials in the First Amendment, 2005. He's been at the center of the cases that we have studied and the controversies that we have studied over the past decades. And in many important ways, he has shaped our understanding of the First Amendment because he wins a lot. And as a result, it's important for us to listen to the way in which he sees the First Amendment, even in all of those areas in which we wish he hadn't won. <laughs> but in this one, I'm really glad that he won. He was co-counsel to the New York Times and the Pentagon Papers case. And all of us know how important a moment that was in the history of our country and also in the history of our Constitution. He was counsel to the Brooklyn Museum of Art in its legal battles with Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. He was counsel to Senator Mitch McConnell and the National Association of Broadcasters 
in his First Amendment-rooted challenge to the constitutionality of McCain-Feingold. He was counsel to Senator McConnell in the Citizens United case and counsel to many journalists, including Judith Miller and Myron Farber, who sought to protect the identity of their confidential sources. He has represented virtually every major media organization in the country. The Times, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, Time Magazine, Business Week, The Nation, Reader's Digest, the McGraw-Hill McGraw Companies, and numerous other clients. He did not represent Walter Annenberg during any of those battles, as far as I know, but if he had, Walter Annenberg would have won. It is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest, Floyd Abrams. With the acumen of a great surgeon, uh, I'm wired. So thank you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me to be here. Uh, you may have seen the title <clears throat> of this uh, speech as uh, having been, past tense, the First Amendment and campaign finance. Uh, and that is certainly something uh, I'm going to talk about. One of the problems with accepting a, speeching, a speaking engagement months in advance of the speech is that things happen in the intermediate months. Um, I used to deal with that uh, by uh, talking about whatever I wanted and titling the speech so generally that no one could possibly say <laughs> that I was not being responsive. I, in the late 1980s, I would often speak about one thing or another, but under the title, uh, The First Amendment in the Year 2000. <laughs> um, and I want you to know, for any of you that weren't around or don't remember those days, 2000 has a resonance to it. Um, and then in the 1990s, I gave some speeches with the title, The First Amendment After the Year 2000. <laughs> but a time comes when you can't hide behind that anymore. And it had long since come when I was asked to talk about this. Um, I say that by way of introduction because I thought I would uh, start out by talking about an immediately raging uh, controversy um, and then turn to a controversy which is of long standing, which goes way back which will cont continue for many years in the future. Uh, the immediate controversy of which I speak and which the uh, piece I uh, wrote, which was published today in the Wall Street Journal, relates to the uh, opera, The Death of Leon Klinghoffer, uh, which uh, is uh, opening uh, for the first time in 11 years at the Metropolitan Opera uh, in New York uh, next Monday night. Um, there have been uh, protests, uh, there have been defenses. Uh, the, the, the briefest summary uh, is that in 1985, uh, uh, Mr. Klinghoffer, a 69-year-old man, uh, disabled, uh, and his wife went on a cruise on an Italian uh, cruise ship, uh, the Achille Loro. The ship was hijacked by Palestinian terrorists uh, who shot Klinghiver in the head and threw him overboard uh, in his wheelchair. Uh, John Adams is a serious artist recognized as a leading creator of modern opera. He is the creator of the opera opening on Monday called The Death of Leon Klinghoffer. Uh, first produced in 1991, which contains in operatic form a running debate uh, between the killers uh, who voice a number of uh, undisguisedly uh, anti-Semitic remarks in the course of justifying their conduct uh, and their victim. Uh, protesters, and you will see on television Monday night and Tuesday morning, uh, are demanding that the opera be canceled. Defenders couch their position, as the New York Times has, in terms of artistic freedom, 
or as one uh, letter writer to the Times put it, helping us to understand uh, the anger, the frustration, uh, and the grievances of other people. <coughs> so, in, <coughs> in Joan, Rither, Joan Rivers' much repeated phrase, uh, can we talk? Uh, some things are easy. The opera is protected by the First Amendment. Uh, the Metropolitan Opera House is protected by the First Amendment. It would be a gross and obvious violation of the First Amendment if the government saw it in any way to bar the opera from being publicly produced or imposed any punishment for doing so. Beyond that, canceling any public artistic performance because it expresses unpopular or even disagreeable or even inaccurate or outrageous views is dangerous. Some years ago, I represented the Brooklyn Museum when the then New York City Mayor Giuliani uh, sought to shut it down, literally to shut it down, uh, because he viewed some of its art, and I use his language now, as sick, uh, disgusting, and sacrilegious. And I argued uh, then, successfully, that the mayor's conduct uh, violated the First Amendment. But it seems to me that the controversy over the Adams uh, opera cannot be dealt with sufficiently by reference to the First Amendment or even to artistic freedom. Those who run, those who direct the Metropolitan Opera uh, made a choice when they decided to offer uh, this opera. And I think it's altogether fitting and entirely fair that they be publicly judged uh, by that choice. I ask myself, suppose the opera had been about a different murder and the Met had offered an intense, two-sided, operatic discussion of the desirability, say, of the murder of President Kennedy in a work called The Death of JFK. Or suppose there were an operatic production of the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in which singers on the side of the assassination offer racist views in support of their position? Or what about one of the thousands of people, uh, the thousands of victims on 9-11 uh, in an operatic debate uh, between her killers and herself about whether her death was justified? I think we all recoil uh, at all of these. They would all be protected by the First Amendment. But the First Amendment is basically and gloriously content neutral. It protects not only enduring works of art, but the sort of dregs of human imagination, ranging from films of animals being tortured and killed to the publication of Mein Kampf itself. But it is inconceivable to me that the Metropolitan Opera would have chosen to offer the public any of the operas that I have just hypothesized for you. And so for me, it is impossible not to ask, why would you offer one that equates, sympathetically no less, the murderers of Leon Klinghoffer with their victims? Undoubtedly, there are grievances on both sides, all sides of the Middle East conflict, but on no theory, on no theory that I would credit, can there be any moral justification for the murder of Mr. Klinghoffer? John Adams has defended his focus in the opera on the motivation of the killers by saying that it helps to explain, quote, what in the mythology that they grew up with forced them or dared them to take this action. 
but the killers were not forced uh, to murder Mr. Klinghoffer, and they were not dared into murdering him. They chose to commit their crime. So did Lee Harvey Oswald, James Earl Ray, and Osama bin Laden. We can expect no arias to be sung in their defense on any theory at the Metropolitan Opera. And there is, in my view, no justification for any to be sung for the Klinghoffer killers. I ask myself, suppose the Oxford Union, the fabled great uh, place where debates have occurred, perhaps begun, uh, had, thank you, had uh, proposed a topic for debate with respect to the opera. And suppose they phrased it this way. Suppose they said, resolved that the killing of Leon Klinghoffer was justified. Suppose any of you were asked or given the chance to take the negative side, the pro-Klinghoffer, the anti-murder side in that debate. Would you do so? My answer is, I hope not. I hope you would say that that subject is one on which no rational nor morally justifiable two-sided position is even justifiable, is even possible. One can argue passionately about the Middle East, about Israel, about the Palestinians, but nothing makes the Klinghoffer murder morally tolerable. The, the great, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the great legal scholar Alexander Bickel recalled in his book, The Morality of Consent, that he had heard that in the late 1960s, a, a crowd of students and faculty uh, had gathered around an ROTC building uh, on a, a campus on a prominent uh, campus to discuss the question of whether or not to set fire to the building. The faculty members, Bickel surmised, took the position that they should not burn the building down. <laughs> and the affirmative side, after a vote, narrowly won. And the building was not burned down. This was Bickel's conclusion. The negative taken by the faculty, he wrote, had become only one side of a debate which the faculty rendered legitimate by participating in it. Where nothing is unspeakable, nothing is undoable. And that's where I come out with respect to the decision of the Metropolitan Opera to offer this opera. What Professor Bickel wrote, it seems to me, applies here, where nothing is unspeakable, nothing is undoable. The murder of an innocent civilian uninvolved on any rational theory, an ongoing conflict in the Middle East or elsewhere, was an unspeakable act, period. His demise is not a proper subject of debate, only of mourning, and of how best to prevent future murderous uh, attacks. Now I will turn to the cheerier subject <laughs> of campaign finance. <laughs> only slightly less overheated, I want to say than discussions uh, of uh, actual murder. Uh, did you notice how many corporations I've already mentioned in what I've said so far? In legal parlance, the Metropolitan Opera is a corporation. So is the Brooklyn Museum. So is the University of Pennsylvania. Does that make you pause a bit when you consider the sustained criticism of the Citizens United opinion 
for, among other things, its baseline ruling that corporations, like individuals, may participate in the political turmoil of the nation by purchasing advertisements, or, or spending to put material on television uh, in support or opposition to candidates, uh, referenda, uh, and the like. Remember, Citizens United was about a 90-minute uh, attack on then-Senator Hillary Clinton, basically arguing she was unfit to be president at a time in 2012 when she looked, seemed to be the leading Democratic candidate, uh, a film prepared by a very conservative group uh, that wanted to bring her down uh, if they could. Um, let me personalize the corporation issue a bit. When I think of clients that, that I or my firm have represented in First Amendment cases, I do think first of some individuals. Uh, Judith Miller was mentioned earlier, Myron Farber, reporters for the New York Times, and now New York Times journalist James Risen, uh, who has been resisting efforts by the Obama administration to require him to reveal his confidential sources. But I also think of corporations, and not just enormous media corporations, but ones like Barnes & Noble that I represented when uh, then special counsel uh, Kenneth Starr subpoenaed from them records in order to try to show what book she had purchased to give to President Clinton. Uh, and in which uh, we were taking the position that they should not be required to provide that information as a First Amendment matter. Or I think of a motion picture company uh, we represented that sought advice as to whether a scene uh, in a much honored film called The Reader, uh, which showed a 17-year-old star of the film uh, sexually entangled with an older female star. And we advised them on whether that violated child pornography laws uh, in the United States. It was filmed abroad. And representing a number of uh, liberal arts colleges uh, around the country, all in corporate form, that weighed in on the subject of whether affirmative action was uh, per se unconstitutional. And I think of a tobacco company that I represented in a challenge to an FDA rule that required 50% of every cigarette pack to have pictures on it uh, of dying or dead people uh, who had uh, smoked. And I think of the fact that right now I'm spending a great deal of my time representing a credit rating agency and arguing that when the Department of Justice commenced a civil action against it, and only it, arising out of ratings that were the same as other rating agencies, and my client was the only one that had downgraded the debt of the United States, that the government may have violated the First Amendment because it is not permitted to retaliate against critics by using the law in a selective fashion. I rush to say that I appreciate that you may not agree with all the positions we took, or uh, surely not with all the clients that we have represented. But one thing is common to all the examples that I've cited to you. No one, no one in any of these matters, not any opponent, not any judge, no one said anything to the effect that since our client was a corporation, it had no First Amendment rights, and therefore uh, should not be heard to say that those rights had been violated. I don't exaggerate to say if, that if anyone had said that, they really would have been laughed out of court. Yet much of the public debate, not so much amongst uh, law professors and the like, sounds as if it was shocking for the Supreme Court to have treated corporations as if they could receive the same level of First Amendment protection 
as individuals have. The opinion written for the Supreme Court, the majority opinion written by Justice Kennedy, cited 25 prior cases, including some involving for-profit, non-media corporations in which First Amendment protection had been afforded by the court to corporations. Even the opinion, the dissenting opinion by Justice Stevens observed that, quote, we have long since held that corporations are covered by the First Amendment. But later on, in Justice Stevens' opinion, he said, quote, corporations have no consciences, no beliefs, no feelings, no thoughts, no desires, uh, unquote, as if that wiped out all those First Amendment rulings. Or Senator Elizabeth Warren telling us that, quote, corporations are not people. People have hearts, they have kids, they get jobs, they get sick, they cry, they dance, they live, they love, and they die. I didn't read that with proper emotion, but, 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 but you, can, <laughs> you can take it. And it's all true. And it's all totally unresponsive to why we protect corporations in this area. Not because they're corporations, but because what they're doing is engaging in speech. Political speech, no less. The sort of speech that we protect most uh, under the First Amendment. Or a good friend of mine, NYU law professor, Bert Newborn, writing that unlike corporations, human beings, quote, die, do not enjoy economic advantages like limited liability, and most important, have a conscience that sometimes transcend crude economic self-interest, unquote. These differences, Professor Newborn has argued, raise a threshold question about whether corporations are even in the First Amendment ballpark. And it's worth pondering what sort of country and how different a country that we would live in if the answer to that question were a negative one. Not only would all the examples I cited a moment ago become moot, welcome home, Mayor Giuliani, uh, in the sense that the First Amendment arguments made in them would not have even been considered, but our great and powerful and so important press entities would be at peril, every one of them. The New York Times, a newspaper owned by an entity called the New York Times Company, disagrees with me about that and has gone so far as to publish an editorial in November of 2012 responding to a speech that Justice Samuel Alito uh, gave about the Citizens United ruling. Justice Alito had said that the press ought to welcome the conclusion that corporations basically have the same speech rights as individuals. And the Times said he was wrong because media corporations did not receive protection because they were corporations, but because of the role the press plays in an American democracy. But this misses the point. No one has ever argued that corporations, media or not, receive First Amendment protection because they are corporations. The real question, the legal question, is the opposite one. Should corporations be held not to have First Amendment rights because they are organized in corporate form? We protect free speech and free press for the same reason. Justice Robert Jackson put it this way, he said, the purpose of the First Amendment is to foreclose public authority from assuming a guardianship of the public mind through regulating the press, speech, and religion. But the Times position as expressed in that editorial was that while press corporations should receive full First Amendment protection, that there was no reason, quote, why any corporation that does not have a press function warrants the same free speech rights uh, as a person, unquote. 
gone then, gone, would have been the free speech protections for all the various entities that I mentioned a moment ago, from Barnes and Noble trying to protect the confidentiality uh, of one of their book buyers, to the motion picture company trying to avoid being charged with violating child pornography laws, uh, for colleges and universities uh, who have the view that they have First Amendment protection uh, to allow them to engage in affirmative action without violating some uh, law, and for corporations that offer music and dance and theater. Ironically, the Times position sounds to me eerily like one advocated years before by Robert Bork, of whom it was no fan. Bork argued, he later changed this position, that only political speech should receive First Amendment protection, leaving out dance, novels, movies of a non-political uh, sort. Um, and the Times position, if anything, is narrower still and much more self-serving. And that is that the only corporations worthy of protection have a press function. What Citizens United says is that all individuals, partnerships, corporations, whatever, are protected by the First Amendment from the governmental authorities that would, in one way or another, stifle their expression. Now, the law in the Citizens United case has a media exemption in it, thus allowing media corporations uh, to have their say as they choose at whatever length they want with whatever level of repetition they chose, something one would have thought was protected by the First Amendment. But at the same time, non-media corporations were barred within 60 days of an election or 30 days of a convention uh, from spending uh, any money for an endorsement or a denunciation or whatever of a candidate for federal public office uh, within 60 days of an election or 30 days of a convention or a primary uh, if it appeared on television, cable, or on satellite. Those very limitations applied to unions, incidentally, were limitations that led President Harry S. Truman to veto the Taft-Hartley Law in 1946 on the ground that it was a dangerous intrusion, President Truman said, uh, into free speech. To put it a little more starkly, what Congress did was to exempt the generally large corporations that own newspapers from criminal sanctions for publishing endorsements, but put at risk union leaders for handing out copies of those endorsements to their members. And in my view, that sort of favoritism of the corporate press by Congress should provide no basis for any sense of relaxation by the Times or others in the press. What Congress gives, Congress can take away. What Congress exempts, Congress can include. What Citizens United says is that the First Amendment bars Congress from going down this road uh, in the first place. There was another issue addressed in Citizens United that I think is more difficult. There is no doubt Congress may pass legislation, as it often has, drafted to deal with certain forms of corruption. In Citizens United, the court provided a narrow definition of what sort of corruption Congress could deal with in this area, basically saying it had to be what they called quid pro quo corruption, money for votes. I'll give you money if you vote the way I'm telling you to vote. And some serious observers have argued that a broader view should have been taken. Professor Zephyr Teachout, in her recent book, Corruption in America, faults the court for not taking sufficient account of the power, the influence of money 
of leading to undue influence, to ingratiation, to access, and the like. And these are not frivolous concerns. Jill Lepore, writing in The New Yorker a few weeks ago, put it this way. She said, the narrower the court's definition of corruption, the less Congress can do about money and politics. That's true. But another way to same thing, say the same thing is that the broader the court's conception of the First Amendment, the narrower the definition of corruption has to be. Any definition of corruption that assumes, as Justice Kennedy put it, that any favoritism or influence over public officials is tantamount to corruption would imperil First Amendment rights Precisely, Kennedy said, because it is not avoidable in representative politics since it is the nature of an elected official to support certain policies and necessarily to favor the voters and contributors who favor the same policies. Now, you may have noticed I haven't said a word about the on-the-ground impact of Citizens United, and that we all know is a horror show of enormously increased corporate political expenditures by super PACs, diminishment of participation by real people, and an enormous boost to the Republican Party, except that it hasn't worked out that way as to any of these assertions. Did you notice, for example, that as the Washington Post published last Friday, that right now, weeks before a nationwide congressional election, Democrats are dominant on the TV airwaves, or that Mitt Romney spent more than Barack Obama did. I'm sorry, that Mitt Romney spent less than President Obama did in the last election, or that smaller donors, as David Brooks pointed out last Sunday in the New York Times, were just as likely to be active after Citizens United as before. When Citizens United was argued in the Supreme Court, the government warned that if the largest corporations in the country devoted just 1% of their profits to electoral advocacy, I'm quoting, such spending would have more than doubled the federally reported disbursements of all American political parties and PACs combined. The reality is that since Citizens United, no Fortune 100 company appears to have contributed a penny to any of the 10 highest grossing super PACs in either the 2010, 2012, or 2014 election cycle. None of this means Citizens United has not had impact or impact that many people would find uh, disturbing. Wealthy individuals who had been permitted since 1976 to spend unlimited sums uh, of their own money supporting candidates uh, or, or the like have contributed significantly more since Citizens United. They didn't need Citizens United to be able to do that, but at the least they learned from Citizens United that they could do that, uh, and they have uh, done that. Um, and while we know to the penny how much all of these PACs and these super PACs included have spent because the Supreme Court affirmed the disclosure requirements adopted in the McCain-Feingold law. Corporate money donated to so-called social welfare organizations under a different part of federal law are not disclosed because Congress has not passed a law requiring that they should be disclosed, as I think Congress should. But what is clear, I believe, is that the, the, the cries of the predictions of national doom that accompanied the issuance of Citizens United have simply uh, not been justified. Two final points. From my perspective, the, the impact of the ca <coughs> case may be more important in terms of how we view the First Amendment in other cases through the years than in any other way. There's a recent case, the McCutcheon case, some of you may know about, which struck down a cap 
on contributions that may be made, contributions, giving money to candidates directly rather than just spending them, spending your own money or a corporation's own money on ads not gone directly to the candidate. The McCutcheon case said that, that you couldn't have a, a cap on the total amount of contributions to all candidates. And what's striking to me there is not the majority opinion, but the dissent uh, of, of the liberal jurists on the court. Uh, Justice Stephen Breyer's dissenting opinion said the following about the First Amendment. He said, the First Amendment advances not only the individual's right to engage in political speech, but the public interest in preserving a democratic order in which collective speech matters. The First Amendment, he argued, must be understood as promoting, quote, a government where the laws reflect the very thoughts, views, ideas, and sentiments, the expression of which the First Amendment protects. And this view was consistent with Justice Breyer's view expressed in a, a book he wrote called Active Liberty, in which he argued that the primary purpose of the First Amendment was one which goes beyond protecting the individual from government, but encouraging the exchange, quote, of information and ideas necessary for citizens themselves to shape that public opinion, which is the final source of government in a democratic state. Now, on one level, it's difficult to disagree with Justice Breyer's views, since it is absolutely undeniable that by restricting the power of the government to control, let alone limit speech, the First Amendment protects, on the broadest level, uh, a democratic order. But to me, uh, and to the, I will say, conservative majority on the court, relegating the core First Amendment interest of protecting the individual against the state and permitting the government in the name of advancing democracy to limit speech about who to vote for, the amount of speech, the identity of the speaker and the like, risks a lot that the First Amendment was written to protect. And as for Justice Breyer's disturbing reference to collective speech, uh, I would rest on Chief Justice Roberts' observation that any such notion is contrary to the whole point of the First Amendment, which is not to protect collective speech, let alone to require it, but to protect individuals and others against government determination as to speech. Finally, I wanted to close with just a, a look back at one of the most heartening developments in recent years with respect to the First Amendment. I must say, what I'm about to say in closing is something which is, ought to be the basis for another speech here entirely. So I, I will simply say that by my lights, one of the most heartening developments is the degree to which conservative members of the Supreme Court have adopted and supported First Amendment positions to a degree that would have been unthinkable 20 years ago. And one of the most disheartening ones is the degree to which liberal members are abandoning it. Uh, I want to close with an image from a hearing held on June 3rd of this year before the Senate Judiciary Committee. The topic was whether to amend the Constitution, basically to reverse the Citizens United case and other cases uh, in the same area, uh, um, uh, including uh, a case uh, the, uh, uh, brought in 1976 by the ACLU to vindicate the right of individuals to spend money to support candidates they wanted. 42 Democrats, uh, as of June 3rd, some of whom had at considerable political risk, opposed years earlier the adoption of a constitutional amendment 
to reverse a Supreme Court opinion which allowed the burning of an American flag from criminal sanctions, had already announced their support for a proposed new amendment. And many of those same Democrats in 1997 had heeded the advice of Senator Ted Kennedy to oppose a constitutional amendment similar in nature to the one proposed in 2014. Senator Kennedy had said that in the entire history of the Constitution, we have never amended the Bill of Rights, and now is no time to start. It would be wrong, Senator Kennedy said, to carve out an exception in the First Amendment. Campaign finance reform, he said, is a serious problem, but it does not require that we twist the meaning of the Constitution, unquote. The senator who quoted Senator Kennedy in the hearing in June was Ted Cruz. And when he looked, stared at the Democrats, he said this, quote, where are the liberals today? Why is there not a liberal standing here defending the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment? I testified against that constitutional amendment, which ultimately failed to receive sufficient votes to send it to the states, and I'm pleased that I did so. And I join Senator Cruz in expressing with deep regret that not a single liberal or Democrat opposed that amendment. And now that I have won you all over by associating myself <laughs> with Senator Cruz, I'll be glad to take a few questions. Thank you very much. I know you all agree with everything, but, but uh, uh, anyone? Yeah. Limited corporations have First Amendment rights. Uh, First Amendment rights uh, can be regulated in the name of compelling state interests. Is there any compelling state interest that you think would be, would, would uh, the, would pass constitutional muster in the campaign finance period? Well, I think the closest one is corruption. Uh, and the, the best chance for advocates in the future, I mean, let's say, uh, you know, members of the Supreme Court come and go. This is a hotly competitive, hotly <laughs> debated issue on as well as off of the Supreme Court. It's conceivable that a, that a Supreme Court could later say that, that the ruling uh, of the court that corruption means only dollars for votes uh, is, is simply too narrow. I don't think what they'll do, though, uh, is to say something which I think would resonate more with the public. I think all, all the data we have is that the public, to the extent it's heard of this opinion, hates it. Uh, um, and because they think it's just not fair. Too few people, too much money, too much power. That uh, egalitarian sense, which I'm, I'm not really, I'm not condemning by so characterizing it, is one that, that the Supreme Court, really starting in 1976, and at that time, with a bunch of liberal votes as well as conservative, <coughs> have said is an unacceptable basis for allowing Congress to limit speech for what it might view as the greater good for taking away from some people certain power they might have by the fact that they have a lot of money and can spend that money. Uh, and, and it was Justice Brennan, Justice Marshall, uh, Justice Stewart uh, joined an opinion back in 1976 saying that, that the notion that you can limit some people's rights to have as much of a say as, I'm using my words now, they can pay for, as much of a say as, as they can voice in one way or another is, quote, wholly foreign, unquote, to the First Amendment, unquote. Uh, I don't think the court is going to go there, but whether the court might later on uh, take another look 
and say, uh, look, there is a need for a broader view of corruption and therefore for some greater control in this area, maybe. Yes? I want to make an observation first, and then I have a question. My observation about the U.S. Supreme Court is there is not a member of that court that has ever run for office. It, oh, Sandra Day O'Connor had, but when she left the court, and uh, that opinion can uh, drive anybody nuts with the coordinated expenditures, the independent expenditures. Uh, uh, unfortunately, none of their law clerks have run for office either. So uh, that's the background of that opinion. And my question to you is, in this case, in Buckley, uh, speech and money were equated. Did the court have an opportunity to undo what it did in Buckley and not equate speech with money? Because once you don't equate speech with money, then uh, your First Amendment problems go away. Look, there are a lot of votes on the Supreme Court, but only four for that proposition. Um, uh, my, my, my own view, uh, you've already heard in, in a sense, is that while you know, you know, speech and money, of course, are not identical, speech is impossible without the money. Uh, it doesn't just facilitate it. Without the microphone, without the hall, without the camera, you can't run. Um, but that said, I, I want to say a word about coordination. It, it does seem to me that there are uh, things that the court has said uh, in Citizens United and other cases which have simply not been lived up to by the players in the political system. And that includes uh, the notion of coordination. The, the whole notion that there would be a distinction between individuals spending their money and the campaigns not receiving the money, uh, I think has often become a farce. Um, and the Federal Election Commission uh, has not been doing its job. Uh, and there are a variety of you know, political events that, that have occurred which have frustrated uh, that effort. That, that doesn't, by my lights, change the First Amendment dynamics here, but what it does do uh, is to say that uh, you know, there's a need and hopefully the public will be persuaded someday by their votes uh, to uh, adopt legislation uh, or create a new system uh, which will assure that the sort of coordination which is barred uh, and, and which is barred by, by statute, uh, which isn't much enforced, uh, uh, comes into being as a, a genuine uh, reality, but not so far. Yeah, yes. I, I want to come back to the clean copper part of your talk. Yeah. Um, there'll be an article in the Times this Sunday, it's already online by Zachary Wolf, with a long overview of the different productions of clean copper. And when I read that, I read your piece, uh, I, I agree with almost everything in your piece except the hypothetical. Why don't we stop now? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, thank you for coming. Yeah, 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 go on. Except yeah. the, the Oxford Union hypothetical. Yeah. Because one of the points Wolf makes in his piece is that there are a lot of different productions. For instance, this production does not show the murder of Klinghoffer. The film version, for instance, does. So there are a lot of ways to stylize the production to change the tilt of sympathy yeah. uh, in an audience. Um, and I, I wish Peter Gell had not gone ahead and, and okayed this production. But when you bring in the Oxford Union, I thought there was a distinction there, whether the Oxford Union ought to have such a debate and whether anybody should step up to the plate to take one side or the other. Um, I think it would be lovely if the Oxford Union you know, put forth such a debate and nobody stepped up for the killing of innocents. But my question is, do you think it's wrong for the Oxford Union to put on such a debate? Because yeah. if the university is not the last place where anything can be discussed. Oh, man. Yeah. Look, no one's going to jail, you know. I mean, you people out there, you, you can do what you want, you, you know. It, it's, uh, would, you, would you feel differently about the Oxford Union as against who steps up to take either side? 
Uh, no, I mean, I, I think it is morally indefensible to have a debate on whether Klinghoffer should have been killed. You want to have a debate about the Middle East? You want to have a debate about uh, any of these other areas which the, the opera goes into? Uh, I mean, that, that's, that's fair game. You, you, one may like or not like the tone of that debate. My view is that the, the topic, if this is a fair way to describe it, but that the topic of whether some guy should have been killed uh, in, in this situation is uh, so outrageous by its nature that either having a debate about it or doing an opera about it uh, is uh, disturbing and, by my lights, uh, uh, unacceptable. But, uh, you know, we still have this pesky thing called the First Amendment. You know, they could go do it, uh, but, I, uh, but we don't have to like it. And, and I, I do want to say that there, there is not just room, there is constitutionally guaranteed room for people to protest the opera also. Uh, I mean, that will be written about, I will bet, in the New York Times as if they're all yahoos, you know, who don't know about art uh, and uh, don't understand that artistic freedom is important uh, and the like. And when that happens, I think it will be uh, unfair. Yes? Is a redefining of the corporate structure as an entity, as a human being, long overdue? Let me answer that in two ways. Uh, first, I, I, I don't think so uh, for reasons that I've indicated. Uh, I think whether it's a corporation or a partnership or whatever form of association uh, where, where speech is involved, and by the way, I don't have the same view about religion. The Hobby Lobby case seems to me uh, of a different order, uh, but, but, but the First Amendment with respect to speech that doesn't protect speakers as much as speech itself. Uh, and and uh, it seems to me what, whatever the corporate form, whatever the form, in fact, as a generality, that it ought to be treated the same. Now, we don't treat it the same in every case. We don't treat foreign speech the same as domestic speech. I mean, we, we say, the Supreme Court has basically said, it is constitutional to bar foreign money from being used to do the very things I was saying the First Amendment protects. Uh, and I think that's a justifiable distinction, but it, you know, but it, it gravitates against my simply saying speech is speech no matter who engages in it. Uh, uh, the other thing is there's no First Amendment obligation to have corporations. I'm, I'm not suggesting we ought to throw them away, but, uh, but I am saying that, that states have all sorts of way to deal with the form that, that entities take that they permit and give a, a lifetime, or indeed beyond lifetime, uh, a limited liability to, uh, and the like. There, there's no First Amendment implications if some state wanted to be the sort of anti-Delaware uh, and, and say, the, you know, we're, we're gonna have a state uh, corporation free. Uh, they could do it. Uh, they wouldn't attract a lot of corporations, but, but, uh, but it would be perfectly constitutional. Uh, let's just do one, one or two more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry to bounce around, but, yeah. but back to Clay Hopper. Yeah. So there appear to be a not insignificant number of people in this world who embrace the racist views of the, the killers of, of Leon Klinghoffer. Why would we not want to engage those people head on in some way other than simply bombing them? Uh, why, why would we not want to get them in some kind of a forum where we can attempt to show, and we might not convince them, but, but we would have some broader impact uh, as opposed to just somehow pretending that they don't exist or, or, or uh, saying that only, uh, you know, the, the only appropriate response is either ignoring or attempting to destroy? I think 
we can do what you want uh, without legitimatizing as one potential alternative murdering him. I mean, I think, as I suggested earlier, we can have, uh, we, the truth is it wouldn't be that different a debate if you had an opera or a debate or whatever uh, about the Middle East. I mean, after all, a lot of the portions of, uh, of the libretto, uh, you know, uh, the most controversial portions are people uh, on the, I mean, justifying the killing on the basis of Middle Eastern events and arguments about that. All of that seems to me is, is, is fair game. Uh, but it seems to me to accede to the notion that, you know, uh, potentially uh, reasonable people can disagree about well, whether murdering this man was uh, uh, morally justifiable uh, is, is off limits uh, as I define, as I view the limits. Just one at home, yes. Um. Given McCutcheon, which took down some more limits on spending, and given the framework you've laid out, what do you think are the what limits would you said you you think it's justifiable to have a distinction between foreign money and domestic money? But it sounds like if your framework were to be worked out to its logical conclusion, we wouldn't really have any limits on on speech, on, on campaign speech, even though the Supreme Court so far has left some in place. So I wonder which ones you'd still like to get rid of and which ones you would defend. Look, I'd answer that by saying the rule, in my view, the rule has to be we treat all speakers the same and maybe even, and I'm not quite there yet, that we treat contributions the same as expenditures. So far, we're not there. Contributions are still limited. Uh, uh, and, and, and I can see an argument, it's just not a, not a great argument, that, that contributions, giving money directly to the candidate, has the greater potential for inducing uh, uh, favoritism than spending your money to favor the candidate. Uh, they're not identical, and I think the that compromise, which is what the Buckley case uh, reached in 1976, you know, is is, is the sort of uh, practical on the ground. How do you get five votes? Sort of uh, compromise. I mean, well, one of Justice Brennan's favorite lines was, "The one thing you have to learn on the Supreme Court is how to count to five. Uh, uh, and 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 that's what. That's what they do. Uh, uh, so I too <laughs> am prepared to do some business, you know, and, 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 to, and to say, oh, sure, I don't mean it really. All the time, all the time, all the time, you, can, you, know, you can't hold someone up and say, give me your money, I'm going to spend it on politics. Uh, and, 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 you know, therefore the First Amendment comes into play. Uh, they're, they're, I mean, yeah, they're, they're, there are limits, but. The, 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 real, the real question to me, and it's the question in so many First Amendment and other constitutional cases, is what, what's the rule and what is the exception? What, what, what are we really going to live by except in cases where we just can't stand the result uh, of, uh, of an absolutist position uh, uh, in, in a particular area? I think that's where they got to uh, in the foreign money. They didn't even write an opinion. They didn't want to write an opinion. If they're going to have to deal with, uh, you know, how they can say when when people like me, for taking uh, really not not exaggerating my role, but simply saying when the defenders of Citizens United say, as I did a few minutes ago, that as a generality, the First Amendment protects speech, not speakers, which I believe and is true and is pretty good doctrine. Well, that doesn't work in the area of foreign speakers, because there's some other social interest there which has been viewed as so important, the danger of, of our losing our collective American uh, uh, psyche and uh, public losing control. Now, I understand that 
there are lots of people who think we've lost it already because of big corporations or because of other, uh, other events that that have occurred. But, uh, you know, we, we just, Justice Holmes, uh, long ago, in response to some lawyer saying that, uh, you know, if this happens, uh, if basically the country will fall because if you do A, you must do B. And Holmes said, not while this court sits. Um, and, and I think we all really live by that in our, in our own lives, and the court uh, lives by that uh, as well. I think we're over time. Thank you all very much.